This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Nick Humphrey, who is, I guess now you're at Cambridge, but just recently from London School of Economics, where you were Emeritus Professor of Psychology. And, you know, I have to always check the references because I'm, I'm, I'm never sure if you are in psychology or philosophy or physiology. I mean, your work has spanned so many domains over the last couple of decades. Well, Greg, in, at the LSE, I started in philosophy. I then moved to psychology and then I ended up in anthropology. So I think nobody, <laughs> including me, knows quite where I belong. Well, I mean, it is it is interesting because, you know, as we have more and more specialization, it, it seems like it creates an opportunity for people like you who are able to kind of muddle those those boundaries with books, I should say, that span all the disciplines. The most recent book is called um, Sentience, the, the Invention of, of Consciousness. And, and, of course, it's not about the way in which we invented theories of consciousness, although there's a little bit of that in there. It's really about how natural selection came up with this wonderful idea. Um, but you also got a bunch of other books that I have here. Um, this one I loved. It was called Seeing Red from uh, a while ago. Um, there's this one, Soul Dust, The um, Magic of Consciousness, uh, Leaps of Faith, right? Science, Miracles, and the Search for Supernatural. Um, I remember History of the Mind, The Mind Made Flesh in a Dark Time, The Inner Eye. Okay, Greg, make a whole bunch of old. <laughs> <laughs> a lot whole of bunch of books. Bridge, yes. Yeah, but, but I think the latest book, Sentience, what I really liked about it is not only that it kind of summarizes a, a bunch of the themes that you've been working on over the years, but it also kind of discusses your personal history and how you and your thinking evolved over time. And I think that the key issue that you've been thinking about is not only what is consciousness, you know, what is sentience, right? What is perception, but... Um, you know, where do these things come from? Like, why do they exist? Why do we need them, right? If, why would, and, you know, why did natural selection, again, this is sort of anthropomorphizing, but, you know, why, why did we need this? Why did it get created? And if we were to create artificially intelligent agents, as we are, would we have any reason to imbue them? Right with sentience or, or consciousness, or, and, and would it would it emerge even if we didn't intend it? Yeah, exactly. I, I a lot of people assume that sentience will some, somehow just kind of bubble up out of this hardware once uh, machines get intelligent enough, and for that matter, they think the same happened in the evolution of animal life. I think that's wrong. I think sentience is a relatively new invention. It's taken an extraordinary amount of design work in the brain. Um, it probably requires quite a large brain to do it, and therefore we shouldn't expect machines or most uh, lower animals to have be sentient in that way. I know I must be careful about using the term lower animals, but non-human animals. Um, but, for example, I'm already in fairly deep water for suggesting that, that, lo that octopuses are probably not sentient in the way which counts. Yeah, well, I mean, for some people, this is, is a binary, right? And for others, it's a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a spectrum, right? Yeah, um, you're right. People divide on that. Um, I think most people now want to think of it as a spectrum, including my, um, my best friend and mentor, Daniel Dennett, who thinks there's sentience all the way down. He talks about hemi, demi, semi levels of sentience. I just think that's a mistake. I think he hasn't taken on board just how special sentience is. And the fact that there was probably a long history of the brain evolving, becoming more and more intelligent before the need came along for sentience. We'll talk about later about what that need could be, but also a brain which was able to house it. Um, so I've, I've, uh, I've been pushing recently for this, you know, for saying there is really must be a threshold for sentience. Well, maybe we could get our terms clear here because you know sometimes people talk about sentience and mm -hmm. and consciousness uh, almost uh, kind of inter interchangeably. Um, you know how how are those concepts uh, different? How should they be kind of distinguished in in this conversation? Well, you're right; they're clearly not distinguished a lot of the time. Um, I'm I take a rather different line from most people. I think everybody agrees that when they talk about consciousness, 
what they hope they're talking about is the kind of inner experience which we ourselves associate with sensations, with, with living in the world of light and sound and smells and so on, which are transformed by our brain into some kind of magical tapestry of, of experience, which we call, philosophers call qualia or phenomenal experience. Now, without using those names, that's what most people mean by it. And you can see that because they wonder, what, you know, whether the, 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 a dog or a lobster or a machine for that matter, is feeling the world in the way they themselves are. And if so, they assume it would really matter. It would matter morally and ethically. If machines felt pain in the way in which humans do, then certainly we would have moral obligations not to hurt them so far as we were able not to. I think what people are not appreciating is that animals and machines for that matter could have evolved a very long way towards high level intelligent behavior even conscious behaviour, but it would be cognitive consciousness. It would be a behaviour which depends on a particular kind of computational programme in the brain, which has a subject to it. The subject is able to introspect, take account of, of, of all the different offerings of the brain in the global workspace and so on, and out of that produce a well-judged adaptive programme for how to act. That's consciousness in the cognitive sense, and it's, of course, that's all that's meant by in many of the theories of consciousness, for example, the global workspace theory of consciousness. Until recently, almost no theories of consciousness mentioned phenomenal consciousness, mentioned sentience. It was just assumed that it would come along for the ride. For some reason, it was it, people didn't explain it, but it was their intuition that if you have these high levels of of self-reflective behaviour, with it will come the feelings which we all know so well. I think that's wrong. I think that that it can that consciousness could have evolved and has evolved a long way in many animals, without that extra dimension being present. And I think that is the, the real problem now is to explain when it arrived and why it's there. What put me onto that distinction was some early work of mine on the phenomenon of blind sight. A long time ago, it's not so long ago, I almost hate to say it, it was 50 years ago, I was had the chance to uh, work with a blind monkey in the Cambridge Psychology Lab. The monkey has, this was Helen. This, she was called Helen, yes. She's become quite a famous monkey. She has her own entry in the Oxford Companion to the Mind. Uh, um, she, she'd had an operation on her brain to remove the visual cortex. It was done by my professor, supervisor, Larry Weisskrantz, and he was interested in understanding the neuropsychology of vision. It wasn't a great surprise to people that without the visual cortex, Helen, Helen appeared to be blind. The visual cortex is in the new brain, the back of the new brain, which has arisen only relatively late in evolution. Um, I had now this is something that so frogs don't have this. Frogs right? don't have it. Fish don't have it. It's yeah. really only mammals and birds have something like it. Now. Um, a frog, of course, can see perfectly well without visual cortex, and uh, as, as can as can a, a fish, for that matter. What I occurred to me as a brash young student is that if a frog can see without its visual cortex, and in Helen she has the same mechanism still intact that's present in a frog, the midbrain visual system, then why couldn't Helen see? It didn't seem to make sense, and so. While Larry was away at a conference, I took a chance to to uh, get in on the act and sit with sit with this monkey and just try and push her as much as I could, try to persuade her that she could in fact use her eyes, and it turned out miraculously as he used that, used that word advisedly. Nobody expected it. Helen had the capacity to see. Within a few weeks, I was showing that she could reach out and take things from my hand, deftly reaching to take a small object. Seven years later, she was running around a room full of obstacles and uh, uh, completely, uh, apparently, at home in the world. To everyone, it would have seemed she had normal vision. Now, here's the catch. I didn't actually think she had normal vision. There was something rather strange about her behaviour. She seemed to be surprisingly lacking in confidence, as if she herself didn't really believe that she could see. And the kind of evidence for that was that if she was at all upset or frightened, for example, she would become blind again. She'd stumble around as if in the dark. It seemed she could only see, provided she didn't try too hard to see. So uh, back in 1972, I wrote a paper which I called Seeing and Nothingness. And I suggested that Helen's vision 
was lacking something deeply important to normal vision. For us, it's like something to see. I thought for Helen, it probably wasn't like anything to see. She didn't actually, she wasn't aware of the sensory experience of vision. Uh, it was simply a guess about the monkey, because of course we couldn't ask her. But we were on the verge of a remarkable discovery because Larry Weiskantz, encouraged by the findings with Helen, then started testing human patients in a new way. Um, and uh, he had the, 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 the original idea of let's take it for granted. Let's accept the patient's definition that he can't see after vessel to cortex damage. But tease him in a way. Say, look, I know you can't see, but if you could, what would you be seeing? Where is this light I'm holding up in front of you? And amazingly, the patient, to his own surprise as much as anyone else's, was able to do that. It's a phenomenon called blind sight. And why it's so important is that it drives a wedge, theoretically, between visual perception and visual sensation. Blind sight is a kind of robotic ability to see in the absence of any conscious awareness of the sensory quality of vision. And so, starting from that, ever since I went on to treat phenomenal vision, vision sensations, as a separate problem, which we had to think about in terms of evolution. If someone with blind sight can see without visual sensations, then why do we have it? Why is it like something for us to see? And equally, if uh, if if, uh, in, in, if Helen had evolved the ability to have sensations, why did she evolve it? And why could she still manage even when it wasn't present? Well, and then there was this human, HD, right, that you also worked with who yes. had some, her corneas restored and but she was, couldn't... Was a, yes, a, HD was a very an extraordinary and rather moving case. Um, I think she was a case of blind sight. We're not entirely sure of that, but it certainly seems very likely that she was. And the reason is, the reason she'd lost her visual cortex, it hadn't been operated on, but she'd been blind since the age of three years old as a result of cataracts due to smallpox. Um, for the next 15 years or so, she never had any patterned vision entering her eyes. Um, and as a result of that, it's very likely the visual cortex had simply deteriorated. It wasn't being used, and so the brain had put it to some other use. Um, not wasting brain cells, which weren't actually playing a part in vision. Uh, when I first met her, HD had been brought to London to have an operation to remove the cataracts. Um, she was terribly excited about that. She knew how, from other people's accounts, of just how wonderful it would be to be able to see colours and, and, and observe sunsets and flowers and so on in the way the poets described so eloquently, but which she had no access to. So woman with very high expectations. The operation was done to remove the cataracts. It was technically successful. Her eye could now receive light accurately. But th the dreadful thing was that it, to her, she said, it had been a failure. To her, there was nothing new in her vision, nothing that she would uh, count on as being what she had expected to be the, the you know this new revealing experience um, and so when I first met her she was indeed in great despair uh, she, she thought the operation hadn't worked um, and that she might as well give up in fact she became suicidal at one point I had the hunch that in fact she was a case of blind sight that her visual cortex wasn't working and in that case it might be possible to teach her to see in the same way that I'd had the success with, with my monkey, Helen. Um, so I did the same kind of regime with her. I took her out for walks in the parks in London and, and so on. I took her to Falga Square, always encouraging her to observe if she possibly could, to guess what she might be seeing. And very soon it became apparent, yes, she could pick out the crocuses growing in the, in the, in the grass. She could see a bird when it alighted on the fountain in Trafalgar Square. She could step up when she came to a curb, she would reach out for a door handle. Um, suddenly she was in fact using her eyes in a way she hadn't done for the last 20 years. But nonetheless, she said, it hasn't worked. There's nothing there for me, which I count as seeing. And I think that dreadful truth was that she was indeed a case of someone who was able to see without any visible sensation. So uh, what struck me particularly about her was the psychological effects of that on our mood, our emotion. Because 
as I'd half guessed from my own, own earlier work, what she discovered was that her newfound ability to see in no way increased her sense of self or her self-worth. So far as she was concerned, yes, maybe somebody was able to see, but it wasn't her. Um, and so she wasn't able to take advantage of it to build up her sense of self-esteem and so on. So it set me on the path to thinking, OK, well, maybe that's going to be the clue to why sensations have evolved. Maybe their role, most important role, is to boost our sense of self, to have a kind of, to centre it, to make it, uh, to make ourselves have a kind of reality based on living in the present tense of these extraordinary sensations, which from then could go on to ground everything else which we come to think of as our psychological self. In a way, that's of course, follows what David Hume, the philosopher, had said about the self. He said, to his rather dismay, that when he looked on, on in on himself to try to find out who was there, all he could ever discover was a, a, a succession of sensations. And she, he thought that's that can't be enough. I'm, you know, that I must be more than that. But I think he was underestimating sensations. Sensations are magic. Sensations do have this extraordinary quality which gives us the sense that we, who are the subjects of them, ourselves are special and unique. We ourselves are, in some sense, living outside the material world because going on in our minds, from the day we wake up every morning till we go to bed, we are living in a world which seems to have no counterpart in the realm of physics. And of course, that's uh, something a lot of people have worried about. Sensations, qualia, don't seem to, to be explicable in terms of material science. Uh, I think to ordinary people, that's great. It makes us feel wonderful. To philosophers, of course, it makes them feel frustrated and, and redundant because if they can't explain it, what's going on? It's, um, it's become known as the hard problem after David Chalmers christened it as such, though people had talked in those terms long before he did. Um, and it's now the central problem, I think, of the philosophy of mind. How can sensations with these extra dimensions be produced by a brain made simply out of matter? Now, so when you use the term sensation, right, I mean, you're, you're using it in, in, with this extra added element, right, that goes beyond kind of the, the raw sense data no right? I, so, I don't think i don't think i don't know what you mean by raw sense data if you ever had a raw pain which didn't go beyond it if you ever had even a raw sense of red which didn't also have that added dimension they're part and parcel of the same thing for humans mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for other animals we can't be sure but i think for many animals like us they, they, ex they experience sensations as intrinsically having this extra dimension to them and and so this this woman say HD, I mean she could presumably navigate the world, avoid obstacles, right? Um, you know, retrieve food if if needed. So what's the what's the value, the evolutionary value of having this sense of of subjectivity? Or well, this this it's a very good question. Except in the sense we've answered it. For her, it was devastating. Um, she didn't seem to be part of it. She didn't get any sense of being involved in her ability to see. I should say that HD never became very proficient at it. Um, and in fact, because she found it so unsatisfactory, uh, she solved the problem for herself by putting on her dark glasses, mm -hmm. taking up her white stick and going back to being blind, when she didn't need to pretend that she was now having a new kind of experience. Um, it was a brave and, I think, remarkable thing to have done. Uh, but it's for her, it, it certainly struck me, and it, it was clear to herself, that, that without that extra dimension of sensations, even though it was only in the case of vision for her, uh, her life was well, less worthwhile. If she'd lacked phenomenal dimension in all her other senses, in touch and in you know, pain, sounds, smells and so on, I think she would have found that she didn't exist. Uh, Hume said, uh, you know, when I'm not having sensations as when I'm in deep sleep, sleep then, I see, I, then I do not exist. And I think that would be the waking state of someone like HD or uh, any other human with total blind blind sight and blind touch and blind smell and so on, they would not feel they were present in the world. Now, why does that matter so much? It's because for creatures like ourselves, 
who value our own individuality, who count on it in our interactions with other other creatures like ourselves, whom we assume to be phenomenally conscious in the same way, to have the same sense of self. This presence, this groundedness of our of our psychic life is crucial to the way in which we develop our notion of what it is to be ourselves and our role in the world. Um, and that came into its own. It became the essential ingredient of our psychological life once we became the, the complex, to live in the complex human societies that we do, or other animals which have complicated psychological relations with other creatures like themselves. Uh, I coined the word a long time ago, natural psychologists. Um, that came out of my study of gorillas, of which I looked at gorillas in the forest and wondered what are they using their brains for? And then it dawned on me, they're psychologists. The, the world is doesn't challenge them in many other respects. There's plenty of food around in the forest, aren't any predators and so on. Why do they need these big heads with their big brains? Then I put myself I saw myself in their place and tried to observe it in a different way, and suddenly it dawned on me. These animals are intellectually challenged at another level when it comes to dealing with their social relationships with others, with maintaining their own position in the hierarchy, without manoeuvring others who are nonetheless part of their family group and so on. It calls for really high intelligence. But then I asked, OK, is intelligence going to be enough? These animals are psychologists. Psychology is a very difficult thing to do, to understand another person with a brain like your own. Um, it's the brain is the most complicated mechanism in the universe, as has often been pointed out. Yet you and I can read other people's minds with relative ease. How do we do it? We don't do it by virtue simply of intelligence, of being clever. We do it by using our own presence, our own sense of ourself as a model for what it's like to be the other person. We are introspective psychologists. And you can only understand what it's like to be someone else by putting yourself in their place if you first know what it's like to be you. So you have to have a sense of your own self in order to model the selves of other individuals. And so that's, you know, simple, simply put is now my theory of why phenomenal consciousness came into being and why I think it's really very restricted in the animal kingdom because most animals don't need to be psychologists. Frogs don't need to be psychologists. Dogs do, parrots do, humans do, horses do, dogs don't. Sorry, sorry, fish, fish and frogs don't, lobsters don't, and nor do octopuses. Octopuses don't have a social life. They're almost totally asocial in their relationships, so they don't need to have a theory of mind, so they don't need to have a sense of who they are. In fact, I think that if we could by some clever feat of genetic engineering, give phenomenal consciousness to an octopus, it would hardly last more than a few generations. It would be wasted, it wouldn't be used, and so it would disappear. Uh, it wouldn't help an octopus to know what it's like to be itself in that respect. Well, I mean, suppose we have a, a autonomous vehicles, right? I mean, one would think that autonomous vehicles with enough data, enough processing power, right, they should be able to predict right, what another vehicle is going to do, even without a, a theory of, of mind, right? I mean, that's, that's, what the, that's what the advocates of, of machine learning would, would argue, right? Why, yeah. why, would a, why would a vehicle need a, a theory of mind to predict what another vehicle is going to do on the road? Right, so it's because it's a remarkable shortcut. If the, if the autonomous vehicle could, in fact, uh, introspect its own behavior and had a model of how it was behaving and why you know i want to turn left at the next uh, the next stop because um i believe this is so and i've a memory of it being like that and so on um if it had that narrative of its own life and could apply it to modeling another another autonomous vehicle i think that would be indeed a very great help and i wouldn't be surprised if it's not something which the engineers catch on to that they do need to give vehicles a theory of mind and maybe the best way to do that will be to let them learn what it's like to be the creatures that they, the vehicles which they are to start with um unfortunately the, the the military engineers may soon discover that 
too, and um, in designing drones and cruise missiles and so on, uh, which are going to have to outwit other uh, military hardware, they may decide to give them some kind of inner consciousness because it's a very good strategy. But I don't think it, that did that need did arise uh, in most animal species. Now you you talk about the 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 Mary problem, right? You know, mm -hmm. if if you if if someone could read everything there was to know about the color red, right, and and uh, you know understand wavelengths and and understand the uh, the symbolism in human culture and so forth, what extra added information would be provided by actually seeing something red and activating that that sensation? Well, it said we we ask as the problem is posed when Mary this colorblind scientist also has been brought up in a color colorless world but knows everything about it when she finally gets to see red in out in the open does she learn anything and uh, i want to turn the question around and say uh, what do we learn what do we know about what it's like to see red unless we're looking at it when it's online, yes, something's happening and we can respond to it and we have this sense that we understand what it's like. Turn away and our knowledge of what it's like to see red is very poor, much poorer than most philosophers and other people have imagined. And there, only recently there's been some other papers now about whether we know what it's like to be in pain when we're not in pain. It's always assumed we know a vast amount about these uh, int intricate, impressive experiences, whereas in fact I think it's quite limited. So I think that the limited, I think Mary would very likely know about what it's like to see red in just the same way as you do now if you had to explain to somebody what it's like to see red. You're not allowed to say what it's like this and point at a red patch. You have to say what it's like, say what your knowledge of it is. Um, and I suspect that uh, Mary could do quite as well as you could. Well, I mean, the way you describe HD, I mean, it seems like more of a, a bug than than a feature, right? This this need to uh, this sense of of self that one has to have in order to be motivated. You described this story of the the hiker in the Andes who fell in a crevasse. I mean, that's one of the <laughs> craziest stories that I've ever read. Where you know he awoke and found himself in excruciating pain and and laughed with with joy because that that meant that he was alive. I mean, you know, the frog doesn't doesn't need that kind of uh, assurance or, or motivation to presumably, you know, do what it needs to do to get out of the crevasse, right? I mean, how is this? I mean, this this seems this seems like a weakness or a flaw potentially. That, no, that it's um, the, the 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 climber Joe Simpson, uh, having fallen into the crevasse, knocked himself out, came to, and then asked himself, am I dead? And then he felt this pain in his leg. He thought, no, fuck me, I'm alive. Um, and with that great th thrill of excitement spread through him. So I make tell that story in order, order to show that, that even pain can be life affirming. It gives us our sense back that we are there. Well, it's a case of being there, which was uh, otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't exist. Um, and you're right, of course, that many animals, of course, plants and many machines, don't have to be continually have this confirmation of their own presence. Um, and I and uh, I think that's because in other contexts they don't they need to think about what it's like to be me or whether I'm another animal is present in the same sense that I am. So it's it's an extra, I agree, but it's one which um, it's uh, provided a crucial new form of of imagination, which really has become essential to our understanding of the world we live in. I mean, people have pointed out to me, Dan Dennett did, David Chalmers has done, okay, they say, well, animals were getting along just fine before they had this new sense of themselves. And I say, well, yeah, and animals were getting along just fine before some of them developed feathers and began to fly. Um, the fact that you're managing fine doesn't mean you couldn't manage even better if you had a new faculty. And what flight did was to open up a new, a dimension, a new world to live in, um, the, 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 the realm of trees and mountains and the air, basically, which wasn't available before. I say in just the same way that having this 
phenomenal consciousness and sense of self opened up a new ecological niche for human beings. Um, I've called it the soul niche. Uh, which mm. it's, I think humans live in the soul niche. It's a niche centered on the idea of our, our individuality based on our self-consciousness. They, we live in that soul niche in just the same way that trout live in rivers or bed bugs live in beds. Um, it's they, you know, they're each to their own, but to humans, we that's the place in which we've been designed to thrive. And thrive we have. I mean, almost all the achievements of human beings are based on building on our own sense of our own worth. It's what's driven human culture and, of course, some of the more dangerous aspects of human culture too. It's what lies behind religion and a lot of uh, crazy thinking about what it is means to be a human being. Um, maybe there really is a, a, a biological downside to that, or there could be, um, but nonetheless, it's obviously been there in our past history, and I and I think it's 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 you know it defines what it means to be human. Now, you may say that okay, this is fine for human beings. I know what you what they're talking about when they talk about the soul. That's because. Uh, culture has taken this idea and run with it. Um, it's parlayed the notion of the self into this much more grand notion of a supernatural and maybe immortal entity, which we call the soul. Um, and animals aren't going to do that. Um, now, that's right, I agree. And there's no sign yet that animals have any sense of their own immortality or build on that in order to create goods for their future immortal self and so on, all the things which have driven the evolution of civilization. But nonetheless, there are circumstances, I think, in which uh, a need to, to the affirmation of your own existence, even for an animal, could get it out of uh, a deathly situation where, in other cases, it wouldn't it wouldn't be happening, um, where uh, this drive not, not to be extinguished would come to the fore. And because animals who have a self like ours know what it's like to be extinguished, they've experienced it uh, in, in sleep and so on, um, they recognise the possibility at some level in the way that we humans clearly do. We know what death might be like and we don't want it. Well, uh, you did work early in your career on the paranormal, right? <laughs> and, and, and it seems like well, the... I the, the... It would, I, yes, I, I did research on other people's belief in the paranormal. Uh, right, but it's, it seems like, you know, belief in the paranormal, a lot of us think that that's a, a primitive thing, that it's something that, you know, we need to put behind us. It's kind of associated with the the, the less rational aspects mm -hmm. of our being and we define ourselves as the, the, the rational being. And so, you know, the, the less superstition we have kind of the more human we are. But, but I think part of what you're arguing is that that, that is really, it's, it's sort of an integral way of, of thinking, right? It's almost in, inseparable from our understanding of our, of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. This, this I belief do. in, in yeah, I think the soul I is, is it sense is, is itself sort of a, a, a paranormal belief, right? Yeah, I, I do think something like that. I mean, I think that humans are by nature spiritual beings and that's because of the kind of consciousness that have evolved in us. And I think for that matter, chimpanzees are spiritual beings. Dogs are in some sense as well. They do have this notion of being outside of time and space and matter. Um, and uh, that's a hugely beneficial trait. When it gets hijacked, as it has done by religion, for example, um, and adopted and not for the good of the individual, but for the good of the institution which lies behind it, then I think it can be severely maladaptive. Um, and the other side of that is you know, witchcraft and superstition and so on, which I think, as you're saying, can actually be negative. Um, they Not always, though. I mean... Uh, uh, I think that at times belief in the possibility of an afterlife uh, is uh, it, it makes us behave in ways which are actually really beneficial to ourselves and to and to those we care about. Um, it makes us take care about our reputation, for example. Um, it's a terribly clever trick for religion to have played, which is to say, okay, this isn't after you're, you're dead, you're going to be judged. Um, but it's certainly a way of keeping people in uh, in line. Um, 
maybe for the good of society and for the good of the individuals themselves. So it's not all all negative. It happens, you know, a belief in an afterlife, I think is wrong. It's it's a mistake. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's ne necessarily maladaptive. Um, and so in the work I did on, on belief in the paranormal, that's I tried to show that, explain why it comes to exist and also how it can sometimes be beneficial. Although uh, when, you know, when when uh, uh, cranks and and snake oil chip uh, salesmen and so on uh, get to manipulate people's need for the belief in something else, then of course it can be very dangerous. Now, I think when people are trying to explain the the hard problem, it, it's all about you know how can something come from from nothing, right? And they talk about the you know looking for the the neural correlates of, of consciousness and and you say that that's kind of the, the wrong question right we should be looking for the neural correlates of the representation of mm -hmm. of consciousness what what exactly is the distinction and then you know well, what is this what is this ipsundrum right so i'd i'd never you know you, i'd never seen the concept of the ipsundrum anywhere but except in your okay, in, well, in, okay. in your work i mean are we, are we going to find the ipsundrum if we yeah. if we you know okay, dissect the, the brain is it going to be in there somewhere yeah. like in our mris yeah I think so. Um, what I, I argued is that um, when we talk about sensations or perceptions, for that matter, we're talking about a representation, the way the brain uh, 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 conceives of what is, is out there in the world, what's present in our sense organs. Um, and in the case of sensations, we represent them as having phenomenal properties in addition to simply as having properties of shape and position and so on. Now, a representation uh, is just different from the thing which represents it. And a painting is not uh, is, is, is a representation, but it's a material object. And it's we who interpret it as having the meaning and significance which it does. I think something very like that occurs in the brain. Our sense organs send information to the brain, which it then, uh, it, it then turns into a representation which can be read. And I mean that, literally. It's like a text which we can read off as having certain, the significance it does. But um, we wouldn't expect the text to have the qualities that we read into it. Uh, the text of the novel Moby Dick, for example, we read as being about a white whale. But there's nothing white or whale-like about the text. And equally, when we have a red sensation and see it having phenomenal redness, that doesn't mean there's something in the brain which actually already has the qualities of phenomenal redness. Now, the mistake which so many contemporary neuroscientists and philosophers make is to assume that, that there must be an identity between the brain mechanism, which is the representation, uh, which, which underlies the representation, we could say is the vehicle for the representation, between that and what it's represented as being. Uh, to take a, a, a well-known theory, it's, it's, it's very much in favour at the moment, um, the integrated information theory of consciousness. People like Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi are quite uh, up front in saying, yes, there's an identity between the causal structure of the, of the, of the information being uh, passed around the brain and the properties of phenomenal experience, that really that the, cause, that the information patterns themselves have that quality of redness or paininess or whatever it may be. And uh, it seems to me just a category mistake. If people are looking in the wrong place, once you see that the problem is to how uh, these these experiences can be represented in the brain, we're in a different ball game and one which is potentially sol soluble by the kind of scientific techniques which we are familiar with. Now, you you also say that some people can some people conflate perception and, and sensation, and and you talk about you know, proprioception on, on the one hand and, you know, orgasm <laughs> on the other, um, you know, how can those two, how can those two examples help us to, to kind of te tease these things apart conceptually? Okay, well, I want to make this distinction, yes, between perception and sensation. Perception is how we represent facts about the world. You know, the the, the apple is round, the, the, uh, the chair is heavy or whatever it may, the weight is heavy. Um, uh, the sound is middle C, facts about the world out there. And sensation is how we represent 
our interaction with the sensory stimuli at our body, how we feel about those. Um, so there are different things. When I see a red apple and judge it to be red and round and so on, I make that's a different kind of representation from when I represent what's happening at my eye as being a, an experience of having red light touching my eye and so on. Now, if that distinction holds, and many people before me, at least not enough of them, but some distinguished predecessors of mine have made it, Thomas Reed is the philosopher I rely on very much, and greatly underrated Scottish philosopher of the 18th century. He said uh, outright that the failure to distinguish between perception and sensation had been the cause of most of the problems of philosophy as it existed at, at that time, and I think it still is so today. He, pre he preceded Hume, right? Yes. Well, no, he was contemporary with Hume, actually, mm. almost. Um, Hume, I think, didn't know about him, or certainly didn't didn't take it on board. You can't be right to say he didn't know about him. Um, but uh, Reed was publishing about 1780, so actually he's after Hume. Yeah. Mm. Um, so anyway, with that distinction, then I want, said, well, is there anything, are, does it hold right across the whole spectrum of our senses? And I think realize that we actually know of an example where it doesn't seem to, and that's position sense. Position sense seems to be a case of perception without any accompanying sensation. I mean, if I ask you where your nose is, you say, of course, you know where it is, and you can point to it. And then I ask you, how do you know where it is? What's it feel like to know where it is? You can't answer it. There isn't any sensation accompanying the position sense. Um, so that seems to be a case of pure perception without sensation. And in fact, I've used it as a model of blindsight. I think that might be what it's like to see with blindsight. Uh, at the other extreme, I think there are cases like uh, orgasm, where the perceptual element is pretty non-existent, where it's all to do with what it feels like as an experience occurring in your body, uh, and where the information which you're picking up about what caused it or whatever is pretty irrelevant. So um, it, it seems to me like these are two bookends of this spectrum as sensation. One is almost all sensation, the other is almost all perception. Now, everyone knows about the Turing test, right? And how, you know, that's supposed to, I mean, I think the way it was originally formulated has been superseded, but the idea was that you should be able to yeah. tell whether you've got, you know, a human on the other side of the conversation. But, you know, from your, for your purposes, right, if you think that there is something special about being sentient, then, you know, we should be able to tell if something is sentient from mm -hmm. external indicators, right? Um, what, what are those indicators? And, and, well, I'm sorry, and, sorry a bit earlier than that. I think it must be possible to tell the difference because natural selection has done. Mm -hmm. If sentience, if phenomenal consciousness has evolved by natural selection, it means it's making a difference to how an animal like us lives in the world. That's what natural selection operates on. In the end, it has to lead to greater reproductive success. There has to be some phenotypical yeah, difference that's exactly, observable, right? in behavior or even in morphology. Um, so if natural selection can see it, then so should we human scientists be able to. So that's my kind of credo. There must be a way to get at this. Um, and given that I think th there have to be uh, differences in the way sentient and non-sentient creatures behave, I've then put forward a series of kind of possible diagnostic markers. Um, none of them, I think, are are going to seal the deal, but uh, together I think they add up to a picture of in which, yes, we can say that animals like dogs or parrots are sentient where, where lobsters aren't. Um, and they include a lot of aspects of it. They're mostly to do with evidence for there being a phenomenal self which is being put to use in our relation interactions with other creatures. So use, I, I refer to f familiar tests like the mirror test for self-recognition, which of course not a lot of animals we might expect to have a self, non-self, so don't seem to pass, which is a little bit worrying. But then there have been a good many explanations for why the test hasn't been conducted correctly in the case of animals who have different kind of sense organs from, from we do and so on. And then I, I look for evidence of, of, of theory of mind, of the ability to project one's own mind into someone else. I look for evidence of individuality and respect for other individuals as separate selves, which are in a sense our mirror of our own. And then at a much more basic level, I ask, well, 
okay, if we if the sense of self is so crucial to our development, our psychological development, um, it has to be built up. Babies aren't born with a sense of self. They arrive at it through discovering what it's like to be themselves living in this world of sensory experience. Some feeling pain, hearing sounds, uh, the, uh, uh, seeing the sights they do and so on. That's crucial to building up the sense of self. Um, and if that's so, and if it's so important, we should find sentient creatures going out of their way to uh, explore this realm, to find out everything it's, there is about what it's like to be a sentient being by engaging in all sorts of exploratory play, exploring the limits of their senses, which it's so obvious that, that a lot of our f f f f companion animals and ourselves all do. Dogs do it, humans do it, uh, lambs do it, birds do it. They, they revel in sensation. Uh, other animals like octopuses do show evidence of play, but it's not to do with sensation seeking. They all engage with, with in kind of mechanical play. They want to find out how things work uh, and uh, to explore the, the, the kind of physical properties of the universe uh, that, that they live in. Plenty of that is important to them, no doubt, but they don't engage in sensation seeking. At least not any evidence that I've yet found of it. Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, I kind of troll in my book, I troll through the evidence for it. Maybe I could produce some rather outlandish examples in the case of, of particularly of mammals and birds, um, evidence that uh, we can boost our sense of self, or uh, animals in general do, by self-pleasuring. Masturbation, for example, orgasm is a real treat for a conscious sentient being, and it's remarkably common. Um, it's, I mean, it's remarkably common as, a, as something which we treat ourselves to. Um, without any of there being any other payoff in terms of sexual reproduction or anything else, there's just a paper published last week in in, in Proceedings of the Royal Society about the uh, extent of masturbatory behaviour in primates, um, and the author tries to show exactly how different kinds of masturbation have followed in different lines of primates. Chimpanzees do it differently from baboons and so on, but everybody does it. Um, and we, birds do it, uh, 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 dogs do it, you know. It's, it's there as a behaviour which has no obvious explanation, unless you look at it as a kind of uh, an exploration of selfhood. If I was, you know, if I was to be shown a lobster masturbating, then I would uh, seriously consider whether my theory is right or not. <laughs> right, and and you say that the, the the dividing line where you would expect to see this is really at the boundary between kind of warm blooded and and, and cold blooded animals. Well, you know, why it's, why, it's why is tight, that? I don't, you know, I uh, I think there was a boundary. There must have been. If we don't have sentience all the way down, sometime. It came into existence where it hadn't been there. Um, and in looking for a marker or for a threshold, uh, it dawned on me that there is a rather interesting one, which is that about 200,000, 200 million years ago, our ancestors and the ancestors of birds, mammals and birds' ancestors, became warm blooded. Their temperature rose from average, let's say, 10 degrees centigrade up to 38 degrees centigrade. Um, slightly higher in birds. Now, nobody's paid much attention to what the psychological effects of that were, and I think they're crucial in two ways. Firstly, it made warm-blooded animals are autonomous agents in a way which they simply can't be when their lives are ruled by the environment of the temperature of the environment, where at every night they have to close down and only wake up again as the sun reawakens them. They're, they're, most animals, cold-blooded animals, are pretty much at the mercy of environmental conditions. As soon as warm-bloodedness was invented, um, animals became relatively independent. They could take their set themselves where they wished because they generated an internal environment which was sufficient to keep them stable and, and alive. So that was happening on the one side. So I think that might have been a point at which the development of the psychological self and individualism kicked in. But something else was going on, because when you warm up the brain, when you warm up nerve cells, their conduction speed increases dramatically. Um, the brain of a warm-blooded animal is probably working about four or five times faster than that of a cold-blooded animal. 
And that's not nothing. I mean, it's a sudden, extraordinary thing to have happened after billions of millions and millions of years of evolving brains. Suddenly, uh, uh, they jumped into a new sphere, effectively, where they were working so much faster. I think that that could have made all the difference to generating the attractive states, the Ipsundrum, which you've referred to, which I think is a real event occurring in the brains of creatures like ourselves. And to answer your question, it someday will be detected by MRI, but which probably never got off the ground in our cold-blooded ancestors. Um, so that's that's my reason for putting the threshold there for the time being. I mean, it's possibly unwise to have made it such a public uh, uh, st statement that I think that's where it happens because I don't know if it's right but you know I I think I'm obliged if I'm going to put forward this kind of theory I have done to say when I think it started um, so that's my best guess at the moment. So I know there's some legislation in the UK to ban the boiling of, of lobsters mm -hmm. um, but um, maybe we should be more worried about the tuna, right? Because they they're they're warm blooded, right? <laughs> and less about the lobsters. The tuna aren't warm blooded. I, um, they're I think well, they're... They're, they're they're fish, but they um, dolphins and things. We certainly need to worry about. Oh, okay, because I do thought that, I thought there were some some warm blooded fish. Well, um, there are fish which there. have uh, yeah, there are some which are not totally cold blooded. Have a slight degree of, of ability to regulate their temperature. Sharks, for example, can warm the retinas of their eyes and increase the the visual acuity considerably because their eye the neurons are conducting so much faster. But they don't do it for their whole body. Um, if tuna are warm blooded, well, I better have a look. It's news to me, Greg. But um, you, uh, that yes, then of course it would be a reason to perhaps change our attitudes towards them. Um, one thing we should say though, when it's say, okay, who do we owe? Uh, to whom do we have an ethical obligation to protect them from pain? Um, and I go along with the generally held opinion that that phenomenal experience is particularly important here. Pains which feel to an animal as they do to us, suffering of that kind is significant in a way in which other kinds of sensory experience aren't. Um, and Part of the reason for that is that an animal who experiences pain like that uh, would not would I mean we have a we have an ethical obligation to treat animals in the way in which they would like to be treated, um, and we would want them to be to be treated if we were them. If we were imagining ourselves in the body of an animal with phenomenally feels pain, we wouldn't want it. Therefore, by Kant's golden rule, we have a ethical obligation not to go that way. Um, if the animal is capable of nociception, to use the technical term, of experiencing damage and registering damage to its body in a way which makes it protect itself, but which doesn't have that qualitative dimension of feeling to it, we don't have the same ethical obligations. But it doesn't mean we can treat them as we like. Um, it's very important, of course, that we don't make being sentient the only criterion which we're going to use for protecting uh, animals and plants or other other uh, potentially living beings um, in, in 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 the way we would extend it to to uh, sentient beings, we of course must protect non-sentient beings as well. Uh, they are part of the ecosphere in which we live and for which we depend. Um, they are beautiful and wonderfully designed in their own right. Uh, therefore, it's a tragedy if they are mistreated in a way which damages their future uh, 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 potential as, as denizens of the earth. Um, and uh, equally with, it may be, at some point we're going to say the same about some of the machines we invent. These are such beautiful structures that we can't just treat them as rubbish when we're finished with them. But it's a different kind of ethical obligation. But, I mean... Part of what we do with our theory of mind is we assign human-like attributes to things that, that aren't humans, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we often get accused of anthropomorphism and assigning intentionality to mm -hmm. inanimate objects. Um, you know, do we do, are we in danger of doing that with, with other animals? I mean, I, I read yeah. this, there was this recent study that of said of that, um, you know, when you, when you come back and, you know, your dog has, has chewed up the, the carpet, right? They they found that the dog is not 
looking guilty because they chewed up the carpet. They're looking guilty because you, you, you look at them a certain way. And if you're oblivious to the fact that they chewed up the carpet, they seem to be, they, they don't exhibit this, this guilty look. So it seems like there, this is just stimulus and response, right? That would be the argument. And it there's no, I, I actually think yeah. dogs probably do feel guilt and show it. Um, and it's adaptive for them. Uh, if you are a puppy or a young member of a wolf pack, you, the one thing you don't want to do is to sh make it, uh, let it be known that you're not respecting the rules of the pack. Um, and so if you do do something, which is wrong in that sense, um, better to own up than to pretend or act as if you didn't even know it was wrong. And so that's what I think dogs are probably doing. I think they are showing something which corresponds pretty much to human guilt. Um, guilt is, I'm not sure quite what kind of emotion it is. More, you, uh, uh, Hume called it one of the moral passions, but um, it's it's not exactly a sensory experience. It has it has bodily components to it, but um, I, I'm not quite sure why I'd classify these emotions in terms of of, of their phenomenal properties. But um, what was your question, Greg? You kind of lost it. Well, you did you did this experiment that I really I found fascinating about the the monkeys in the in the boxes, right, with the red box and, and, mm -hmm. and the blue box. And, you know, your, your first approximation of, you know, explaining their behavior was, was one that seemed kind of human-like. And then you, you had to, you know, you're very, very careful to, to do subsequent tests that, you know, revealed that this was a, a response to environmental cues that, that made perfect sense. So, I mean, well, it, it seems like you, it seems like you, you, there's there's the danger of reductionism on the one hand, but then there's the danger of anthropomorphism on the other. How do you how do you navigate that that on a research uh, from from a research perspective? I, I think it's the opposite of what I was taught at school. Of course, I think you start by anthropomorphizing, and then you look at the reasons why you shouldn't. Mm. Um, but I think it's better just as well to begin with the higher level explanation and then chisel away at it. I remember uh, when I was with Diane Fossey in her camp in Rwanda, uh, she showed me a notebook which she'd sent to her supervisor in Cambridge, Robert Hind, um, and in it she'd written uh, that after uh, uh, Uncle Bert, big silverback, had charged me, um, he came to a stop right in front, in front of me and turned away with a sheepish expression on his face. Um, and Robert Hind had written right through it with a red ink, saying, you really must not talk like this. Um, and, of course, Diane said, well, to me, well, why not? That's what he did. He stopped with a sheepish expression on his face. It's the most objective description I could give. Um, and I think she's right. And I think, in fact, it was quite reasonable to assume that Uncle Bert might, in fact, have had sheepish emotions at that point. So let's begin there. Um, and then if we find that, you know, he's showing the same kind of behaviour towards a waterfall or something like that, um, then it's unlikely to be a sheepish emotion. Something else is going on. Um, but... Uh, it's it's of course it's a it's a danger and it's but it's uh, better to be right to be, sorry better to be wrong about it than to than than not to be uh, than to be right when we sorry not to recognise it than when it's actually there. In the case of machines, um, it is already the case that we anthropomorphise them, um, and it uh, our inter our, we interact with them as if they were moral agents themselves and certainly the, as if they have feelings themselves as some of you will remember wonderful sequence in John Cleese's Faulty Towers where when he's uh, driving back with uh, the, with the the goose which he's just picked up from a restaurant to serve to his own clients his car stalls and he gets out of his car and he sets about it with a stick saying back near a bad car bad car what are you doing <laughs> it's a lovely sequence anyway but terribly familiar we know we know those feelings um it's it it, it i mean i'm being anthropomorphic sometimes it's going to be uh actually a useful and sensible way to approach uh the things which we interact with, because sometimes they will have something, if not actually corresponding to feelings, some kind of functional architecture, which nonetheless corresponds to our own. And so we'll, 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 we'll be better at predicting their behaviour if we assume uh, for the time being that they're sentient, which is what we're so familiar with doing. It's what we're so practised in doing. It's, I think, uh, at the moment, I'm just uh, thinking about 
an essay on this for Wired magazine because they want to make predictions about about what's going to happen next year. Um, I suspect that uh, the hype about sentient AI and the extraordinary claims for making being being made for its super intelligence and so on are going to uh, are going to have to be cut down. I think we're going to realize that uh, p people have gone over the top in interpreting the likely uh, level of intelligence and consciousness in AI. Um, and uh, really, there is no reason whatever to suspect that AI is yet or any, any time in the near future will become sentient. There's no reason why it should it won't have been built in by the engineers, and it won't have been won't be there unless it, it's been built in. It's just too clever and sophisticated a program to just emerge from nothing. So, uh, I'm not holding my breath that AI will be sentient any time in the future, unless and until, as you hinted at earlier, actually it would pay off for us to be to to create sentient AI. Now, why might we want to do that? Well. For one reason, because we may want to interact in, want to interact with robots at a social level. We not only want to be able to read their minds, but we want them to be able, able to read ours. And being sentient, nature's solution to this problem may in fact be a very good way of doing it. So we could take a leaf out of nature's book and build sentience into, into a robot, maybe. I've got another grander reason uh, for thinking we may want to do it at some point. And this is a kind of Okay, I'm getting rather rather metaphysical here. I think sentience really matters. I think sentience is an extraordinary invention. Um, nothing else may, like it may exist in the universe. Uh, it's a one-off. Can't be sure of that, of course. And in an infinite universe, maybe anything possible can happen. But it doesn't mean it will have happened. It could have happened, but it won't. We've no reason at the moment to think that the same sequence of events which has produced sentience here on Earth in animals like us will have been repeated anywhere else. Uh, so uh, when Frank Borman looked from Apollo at, out at the moon and sorry, out at the Earth, um, circling the moon, and uh, said that the Earth was the only thing in the universe which was coloured. He wasn't strictly right, but I think he would have been right in saying that the Earth is the only thing in the universe which contains creatures who are having colour qualia, who are experiencing mm -hmm. it in the way we humans do. Now, that's not nothing. That is an extraordinary thing to have arisen out of the Big Bang and out of the natural selection working for these millions of years to produce brains like ours. Um, if and when humans become extinct or life on Earth becomes extinct, it's going to happen sometime, and let's hope it's a long, long way away, but it may not be uh, because of human mismanagement or accident. It would be a real calamity if sentience became extinct along with us. And so I think we could, out of a kind of, kind of uh, feat of a cosmic generosity, we might want to seed the world, the universe, with sentience to make sure that it can survive our own demise. Mm -hmm. So then we'll build these sentient machines and send out them, send them out to to found islands of sentience elsewhere in the in the universe, which where it doesn't yet exist. They'll still need us to, you know, plug them in and and you know and maintain them and so forth, maybe. But look, last que last question I have, um, you know, there was a time back when you know with Hume and Descartes and maybe even up through. William James, where, you know, philosophers and, and psychologists could kind of co-inhabit the same person, right? The same brain. Uh, and then, you know, we went through a period of, I think, specialization. Are, are we experiencing a, a, a rena renaissance of kind of convergence of those two disciplines? I mean, do you ever feel like you have to put on your philosopher hat and then switch over to your psychologist hat? I mean, do you have to take different approaches when you're publishing in, in different I, journals, I, or, or do you see this as really you know, a unified I'm, I'm field? Not a, I'm not a philosopher. I've never taken a degree in philosophy. I've learned it all on the hoof, as it were, and of course from mentors like Dan Dennett. I have, of course, I have great respect for philosophy. I've also uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, f uh, bad feelings about it. I think it can often be a, a huge waste of time. A lot of the problems on which philosophers are working are simply not worth working on. As psychologist Donald had once said, if a thing is not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Um, and uh, there are a lot of philosophers who simply beaver away at problems which have no considered conceivable significance uh, for our understanding of the universe or understanding of ourselves. Um, but there are, of course, areas where philosophy remains hugely relevant. I think moral philosophy, ethics, is probably the most important one. I think con cognition, philosophy of mind, will give way to, to psychology and neuroscience. Philosophers won't be needed there uh, in the way I think they have been in the past to help people to think straight. Um, so uh, it won't be... I mean, I think we will find more and more people doing who are interested, in, let's say, in philosophy of mind, really uh, spending most of their time doing neuroscience or psychology rather than traditional philosophy. Um, I don't... Philosophy is fun. It should be... I hope we'll keep going with it because some of the conundrums it comes up with are simply just tremendously engaging uh, and give us reason to go on uh, marvelling at things which we mightn't, mightn't be delivered unless the philosophers had explored these arcane areas. But uh, whether there's a convergence otherwise, I don't know. It, I mean, I you know, it has been in me. I've had a particular history. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think I could have followed that path again. The world's different these days. People are obliged to specialise. They're obliged to publish more and more in technical journals, uh, which uh, are going to thrown on explorations of poetry or aesthetics or so on, tagged on to philosophy. From my earliest days publishing, I've tended to uh, to make a, a mix of it, and uh, it's partly why I've written more books than I have papers. Well, it's not quite true, but I've written a lot of books, but it's partly because I can illustrate them with, with examples taken from outside the field of science or philosophy, the, the, the works of the other great folk philosophers in our world, which are the poets and the artists and the and the mission and the uh, the, the uh, med meditationists, the monks, and so on. So, um, I mean, I can get through it back you know, the question at you. You interview people working in these fields. What's your impression? Do you think uh, are are people becoming becoming more and more conversant with alternative forms of thinking in these areas, or maybe it's the people you are probably are. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the people I interview tend to be conversant in, in multiple disciplines. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that in, in many ways, the psychologists are stepping into the, the role of that philosophers may have had in, in, the, in the past mm -hmm. um, and expanding their, their scope, uh, maybe being imperialistic in, in, a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, I just want to emphasize this book, Sentience. It's a great book. I mean, it's, uh, it's called, subtitle is Invention of Consciousness, but I guess it could have also been, you know, your personal discovery of of consciousness and sentience and and how you've made sense of this over the years so it's it's a great place to start with uh if you want to get exposed to nick humphrey and then you can kind of work your way backwards to all the other great books including seeing red thanks nick it's a great pleasure to create thanks this is unsilo brought to you by alumni fm connecting people through stories 